So diviners and people who seek omens, they are seeking to to know exactly, they're seeking to know exactly what is their future. But that's not the, the only one. The other uh, method they use, there's also one, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. This, this is a whole discussion about the future. When I was in high school, I, in primary school, I really had no interaction with newspapers. But in high school, I finally became the chief librarian, and so I had access to the newspaper in my small office. And so I, I, I got to, I do, you know, within that access, I'm able to read. But I discovered the most popular pages were called the stars. You can't be a Christian and use the stars. Just your divination. You, where you, you read, today it says, were you born in December? People that were born in December have, today will have the following. Uh -uh. We walk by faith, not by sight. So that now you just put your day to God, put your year to God, put your month to God, and believe that God who loves you the God you love will take care of any intricacies that come your way. It's the same thing when you have complex and com issues that are, cannot be explained. You are supposed to trust yourself into God's hands. Do not practice divination. Don't seek omens. And uh, it will be a very important thing to learn to trust in God and walk with Him. No, now. We are having even Christians, pastors, who are really like diviners. They do not encourage you to trust God for yourself. They want to prophesy your life. You, have, you don't even have to consult them. They want to tell you exactly how your life should be, who you should marry. Um, they are the ones who want to lead your future. They have become the new diviners. MOG, man of God. And my friend, if you truly are a pastor, you must train people to learn to trust in God, number one. Number two, to seek the mind of God for themselves. Number three, refuse to become the intermediary, intermediary between God and your congregation. Because the Bible says there is only one meditator between God and man, Jesus Christ. So if a pastor or an apostle is starting to want to become the intermediary, there is a problem to start believing that your people have no access to God is as bad as back to ancestral worship. You need to learn that everybody must trust God for themselves. The word of God also tells you it's okay you can talk to your congregation, but they don't have to do your way. We are told in 1 Corinthians 14, the prophet can talk, but the congregation must weigh. That means they don't have to do what the prophet said. They don't have to do what the apostles said. They must weigh. And one method of weighing is to check whether what the prophet is saying or has said and what the Bible says are congruent. May we learn to fully trust in God. I'm currently chairman of an organization in Kenya called Ethical Leadership Network, EONET. We seek to influence society to have ethical standards, ethical leaders, ethical operations. And we are seeking to influence people in governance, whether in judiciary or legislature or executive in the three arms of the government. We want to influence them to have ethical standards. We are also seeking to influence business people to have ethical standards. But we are also seeking to have young people grow believing it is possible to be successful, yet 
following ethical standards. You know, this is a requirement of the scriptures, both New and Old Testament, really are against people who con others, who do things that are not ethical, including even if those people are your enemies, you are not allowed to con them. We are supposed to deal with everybody with ethical standards. I, have put, I, I inserted a list of these standards which, which uh, we thought are critical in, for every leader in my book, Integrity, the Litmus Test of Good Leadership. And my prayer is that all of us who are Christians will know that if we truly are walking with the Lord, we will at the same time be people of integrity, people who have ethical standards, and people who would rather be poor than gain money through wrong means. You know, Leviticus 19.35 says, Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, or even when measuring weight, or even quantity. That's quite comprehensive. That you require ethical standards, whether you are dealing with the length, or weight, or quantity. In the book of Amos, he prophesies against these people who are trading unethically. And you need to ask in your life whether it can be said that your dealings are actually ethical. Are there things you tell your children and then you don't keep your promise? And then when they ask, you just rough with them. You are teaching them in the process that if you are in power, you don't have to be ethical. Ethics are only required of children. They are required of juniors. But you are a leader and you are powerful. They can't ask you questions. Gives you the freedom. And if that value adds up to be in your children, please understand as long as they are junior, they will be ethical. But as soon as they gain a place of power, they start thinking they are excused. They now can do things. That's why you will be surprised that as long as they are junior, they are faithful to their wives. They get into power and they realize, like one of the presidents of America, you can take advantage of a small girl. After all, the girl you will, will feel very privileged to be going out with you and to sleep, be sleeping with you. It's like you are doing her a favor, yet you are exploiting her. All that because you believe that power gives you the excuse not to be ethical. So, the word here used in Leviticus 19 is the word dishonest. So when you're talking about ethical standards, we are talking about honest standards. And uh, if, like I point out in my book uh, on integrity, there are many ways you can become dishonest. For example, you can be a thief of time. How can you steal? You, we can enter into a contract that they'll be paying you for 100,000 shillings for a 45-hour week. But inside the same week, during office hours, you are busy running your rural farm. Like they say in Kenya, you are busy doing your hustle. It's called a side hustle. During office hours. At the end of the month, your employer still pays you 100,000 Kenya shillings. But if truth be told, part of the time, although you are busy on your computer, you are busy doing other things. This has become even more, more difficult with the change in times when people are doing working from home. So you are trusted on your own. And the word of God is, do not be dishonest in the quantity of time. You cannot, just because you are working from home, work less number of hours 
than the required one and earn the same salary. You, the word of God, will call you dishonest in quantity of time. You are a thief, but you never stole money. You never stole gold. You stole time. So we are saying if you truly are a man of God, a woman of God, if you truly are seeking to walk with God, if you truly are obedient to God, the way you relate with anybody and everybody, whether senior or junior, however helpless, however powerful, will be with honesty. So you will not be dishonest. We saw that one of the ways of being dishonest is um, time. But some people are still are thieves of credit. You, they ask you, give me 10,000 shillings, I'll pay you on Friday. You need the money, you have promised to buy your child something, and you need the money on Friday, but you see you, are, you actually are not using it until the weekend. So you agree to give him. On the weekend, he disappears. You phone a standoff, you can't find him. And he's a Christian, so he claims. On Monday or Tuesday, you finally get him. And he says, you know, I had some challenges. I was not able to pay you. Then why didn't you tell me on Thursday? I was in trouble with my son. You don't understand. And of course, he says, no, 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 I'm paying your money. I'm paying your money. Yes, you pay the money on Wednesday. But between Saturday and Tuesday, you are a thief, not of money, because you are still going to pay it. You are a thief of credit. You offered yourself credit without having been allowed by the owner. And I think it's important to understand anybody with a debt, anybody who owes anybody anything, and it's outside the, time, the agreed times, normally banks call it outstanding, debt is in sin. So do not use dishonest standards when measuring the length, weight, or quantity. So really, we are looking at the issue of honesty in dealings with people. You know, some people deal very well in their, fam in their family life. They have honesty, total honesty. Because you see, they feel obliged to be honest. Why? They love those people. In church, they have honesty. Why? The fear of God. But in their business life, they feel like it's not possible. Uh -uh. Like in their country, it is so difficult to do business. Uh oh, you can't make honest, any honest money. It's not difficult, it's impossible then don't be in business. Because if you believe you must be dishonest, and the word of God is saying, don't be dishonest, then you are choosing to go to hell rich rather than go to heaven poor. You know, this honesty requirement, and that's why it's so comprehensive, it is whether you are doing length or weight or quantity, is not situation or ethics so that you can be honest in one area and not the other. You know, that's why we say Christians do not believe in the divide of sacred and secular. To a biblical Christian who believes in Colossians 3.17, in everything, whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. That removes anything secular. Whatever you do, that means even what people call secular, God is involved in it. You must bring honesty in every corner of your life. So, what about sin governance? What about when the telling the truth will be very expensive? Isn't that the message of Psalms <laughs> chapter 15, verse 4? He says, who will go to the hill? Who is a righteous person? 
Who is a man of ethical standards? Psalm 15 verse 4 answers, It is he who makes a commitment, then discovers to make that commitment will hurt him. But goes ahead to keep the commitment and destroy his own personal life. When I read that, the first time I said, wow, that's too high a standard. How do I mess up myself knowingly? You have to. The better thing is, don't make commitment, don't make promises, don't make vows without consideration. Always ask, ask, say, please give me time to think. Pray about it. But the moment you make a promise, you are a prisoner to the person you made the promise of. Not because he's powerful. He may be very junior. But because God insists on you keeping your promises. Irrespective of how it will mess you up. And the God who told you to keep your promise, even if it messes you, will help you out of your mess. But don't claim to be a Christian and be a person whose word is not his bond. He doesn't feel bound to keep his word because circumstances have changed. You can see then, when you talk about honesty and ethical standards, life of integrity, it's not many people who live it. And yet you can't claim to be going to heaven if you do not want to live by that standard. So, like I argue in my book on integrity, the only way you can keep to this, to this command, do not, it's a command like any other, use dishonest standards when dealing with measuring weight, length, weight, or quantity. Like I argue in my book, the only way you can keep this standard is by being totally surrendered to God. Because many people who have cheated you themselves, they are crooks, and they are trying to trick you. So why not con them in return? They deserve to be conned by what they have done to you in the past. If you don't fear God, I can't see you keeping to that standard. Or alternatively, if you tell the truth, they will kill you. Or they will kill your relative or your loved ones. How will you not tell the lie? When Jesus did not want to answer, he just refused and kept quiet. And he was teaching us in the process what you must do. Instead of being dishonest, just simply refuse to get involved and leave them to make their own conclusions. There are, there are not two alternatives, telling the truth or telling a lie. There's a third one, say nothing. I don't think it will be biblically right for anybody to ever be quoted to have said or done something dishonest. It's better for him to be said he kept quiet, he refused to get involved than for somebody to make a decision to lie or make a decision to be dishonest. Sexual immorality is viewed by God as a very, very bad sin. In fact, Paul says every other sin is outside you. But sexual immorality, you are sinning against yourself. Both the Old and the New Testament make it like a terrible sin. I'm not suggesting to classify sins. Every sin displaces God. But if you go through the Bible, you will see there are some sins that are given more weight than others. Not because any sin will be allowed in heaven. Every sin requires the blood of Jesus. You need to repent it. But again, when you go through the whole issue about sexual immorality, God is against it. I've written a chapter on it in my book for young people, Finding a Life Partner, to say that especially for young people, hot blood, one of the things they have, uh, girls and boys have to struggle, especially as they're in their late teens, early 20s, is how to control their sexual drive. And um, 
the word of God is saying, mm -mm, you have absolutely no excuse. You will know, like I argue in that book, you need to understand you are not an animal. Animals, once they are on heat, simply cannot control them. They must have sex once they are on heat. Because heat is not something within their control. But human beings are created different. They have power to say no to an urge. You are hungry, very hungry. There is food there, but it's in a restaurant. You have no money. You just continue being hungry. Despite seeing food there, you don't steal it. Even if you really feel like stealing it. That's the same thing with sex. You must control yourself.